you, Anna, for the presentation. It was most interesting, both in terms of connections and differences. So I'd like to start with things that I resonate with, particularly in terms of my own practice, and uh, taking on from uh, what I spoke about yesterday, which was moving away from the documentary mode, moving towards a form of photography which was collaborative and which sought to make the construction explicit, uh, sort of challenging the claim to truth or the indexical nature of the photograph, I then moved into making photo-based installation. I moved into space. And one of the primary reasons to do that, uh, which is where I find this resonance with the kind of inquiry that you described Lydia engaging in, uh, was the desire to build a kind of embodied viewing, to actually shift the consumption of image and text, or image and sound, which is the dominant form of uh, uh, sensorial consumptions, particularly in this time with the huge rise in television and mass media and mainstream media. It was also to create a kind of possibility of a different relationship by placing the photograph within space uh, and to bring the viewer, uh, she refers to receiver, receiver author, but I've always thought of uh, the terms I've used are viewer, participant. So I give a small example just to open up the conversation. In fact, it's uh, in this very space in 1994 uh, where I laid a kind of mirror-like surface on the floor of the installation which basically implicated every viewer into the narrative of the installation itself so that you were not only looking at these images of women, it was a work that looked at um, different representations of women, I'm not going into the work, but actually willy-nilly brought the viewer into the work itself. Uh, so I'm quite interested in how uh, from the bijou, the movement to structuring the self, actually to my mind, even though you assert that she's still working within a social space, I seem to see a kind of increased privatization of the social space. So uh, would you like to respond to that? In her specific work, you mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking to, because I try in my own practice, go further and further in trying to develop embodied viewing. And in fact, it becomes uh, the, the public art moving into uh, out of galleries, out of museums, trying to build that kind of mm -hmm. relationship yeah. with uh, viewers, uh, which uh, to, to also challenge the kind of consumption model that we inhabit. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important um, to think that it, there's, a, there's a distance of time. So historically, like her context was another one. Um, and um, and I, I see it as um, because she has this whole interest in space as well. Um, Specifically, when she was, um, Lisa was um, working with this uh, idea of organic lines, she started by breaking the frame, uh, but then she was looking for, there's many writings about that, but she was looking for um, in the real space uh, this organic line, and so she started working, uh, doing models of architecture. And then she said that the organic line is everywhere where you open a door or a window and um, and so, but she would still relate it. And there's, there's some works that she did that are models, and then she, she, do, she would do them um, in larger scale. Um, but I think she was still thinking about the surface of the painting. Um, but but I, do, I do believe that if we think of it was the 50s, um, it was still not so... Um, um, I 
don't know, as I, as I see it, I see a, a radical in this time, 50s to 60s, I feel um, that at least many artists that I'm interested in and I work as a reference, for instance, Yudu Meirelles, or that was younger but was part of this, it's, um, there's a, an acknowledgement or um, like it, it becomes part of the discourse that temporality and duration is part of the artwork. And before it was always about one moment in time and, and uh, painting, but also space. So I don't know, I'm just trying to think what, what you asked because um, if I would think of what happened to her, I think it was uh, a retreat, you know, like it, yesterday there was this discussion, but she had a, yeah, Nietzsche was totally like you read, when you read her writings, it's very interesting to read about her crisis and seizures and it's all like in order to come back again and so she would stop producing and say I'm not an artist anymore and then she would come back and try in another way. So I think it was mostly um, this, this um, going to um, the university where you could work with the students and no one is looking from the outside, so this search and, and um, that was taken, yeah, you, it was taken to a more uh, private space. So I'm not denying uh, this, I'm just trying to think uh, um, on the causes of it uh, and also and what uh, Sweetie says in the interview that if she, her, with her whole work, she tried to activate this um, uh, in the receiver, in Sorbonne, she realized that as, as far as when she managed to do it, actually, all when, so this, um, you know, this block area of, um, of the sensorium, these other capacities, so all the traumas come with it, and, and then she started dealing with this, that she would call the phantasmagoria of the body, and, and that's why she moved into this therapy where she felt she could not simply open um, people around <laughs> very um, um, basic, but um, she would have to, to treat it. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I, I think it's a different notion of, um, uh, in that time, if you think respectfully, a, a, a different uh, consciousness of um, the public space and the private. Um, um, which is um, a separation that, particularly from feminist thinking, is continuously um, dissolved and breached and challenged. So, uh, you know, whether, whether we look at attempts to bring uh, another kind of spectator into gallery space, or whether we look at public art, which is taking work out into sites where people would have normally come into art space and engaging in conversations with them. But to come back to this perception, uh, sensorial uh, separation and you also spoke about how uh, regimes under the totalitarian regime there was a kind of damaging of the sensorial uh, which Lydia just spoke about and she saw her work as a form of recuperating or bringing back uh, the connection between the two. I'm curious about uh, the statement about the experiences of totalitarianism actually damaging the sensorium. There's a very interesting work, I don't know if you know it, it's Elaine Scarry called The Body in Pain, where she looks at world making through torture and how torture actually is a form of creating uh, really a new, a new world for both the torturer and the one that is being tortured. And it's a very interesting unpacking of how this then is reproduced in other forms of oppressive hegemonic uh, regimes and situations. So could you say a little more about, uh, because it seems like a, a very broad and very interesting statement, so could you open that up a little yeah. bit? Yeah, um, so uh, um, the totalitarian regimes are, according to Sweeney, the situations when this can be more um, visibly um, repressed, but um, actually her research at the moment, and that's the one that is connected to the process I've been working, traces back to colonization. So it's, um, 
so this um, she talks about the knowledge of the body so I think it's connected to the body but uh, um, the knowledge of the body or the body that knows the names are always changing but it's a kind of uh, this kind of knowledge that we do have when we relate these two paradoxical capacities and then um, and then um, so according to Sully, but I, it resonates on me a lot that um, all the cultures before the beginning of our colonization, most of the cultures like all the indigenous um, native people from Americas, the Jewish, the mystic, mystic Jewish uh, before Inquisition, Iberian Inquisition, in Africa and other places that I would not put at least this, we all had the knowledge of the body, which is this... Um, yeah, I think here, here it's quite easy to uh, understand that sometimes uh, depending on the audience I need to explain it more. But, but then what she, um, her theory is that um, the, the idea of uh, the modern, the modern man and the idea of yeah, illuminism, Russian, and ex extreme rationalization comes from Western Europe and so um, colonization somehow came on top of all these cultures um, repressing this ability that we do have of knowing with the body and so um, um, yeah so it's something that we uh, we need to go back um, uh, further um, yeah to think it to think that almost all the other cultures had it and, and somehow this uh, um, it's the colonialism and the kind of erasure of uh, <clears throat> cultures which had uh, the body as a form of knowledge production, as a form of knowledge perception, uh, quite central to, to the way they um, to the way they conceptualized, in fact, the relationship between human beings and between human beings and the land. Uh, I think we we have. Uh, long and rich layered histories of that uh, yeah. within South Asia and India. Yeah. But I'm, I'm specifically interested in this um, statement about the damaging of the sensorium or the sensorial capacity mm -hmm. uh, under the kind of uh, military uh, dictatorship period in Brazil because that yeah. I, I read some of uh, Suli yeah. And she actually spends some time talking about that, but it wasn't very clear to me as to how this connection is being made. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's, I, it, I think it becomes important for us where we're facing a time where um, culture has always been a battleground, but it is becoming a particular kind of site of struggle today mm -hmm. uh, in India in terms of the kind of new formations that we see around us. So it, it, I think it's of interest yeah. to try and understand this more carefully. So, so I think that the, the idea basically is that um, um, what the authoritarian regime would do in a macro-political level is censorship. So, okay, people cannot talk, people cannot exhibit, and this is, this is um, what is visible to everyone. And, and, but what really... Um, destroys um, the possibility of um, having this um, creative um, potence or that it's like it's as a production of real thought and um, and it's it's what affects the it's the what the, in the micro political level the dismantling of different kinds of subjectivities so let me try to articulate it's um so, at the same time that the macro-political um, censors, there's another kind of strategy that is um, a very basic example is like when, when you are under this kind of situation, it's really like, oh no, but I saw this, this is happening here, I'm sure it happened, and say, no, you haven't seen anything, I don't see anything. It's, so it's a kind of a repression on this... Um, sensorial part and then the person as you were talking yesterday I think Sonia about uh, insanity you know 
when everyone denies that something is happening and then you end up thinking, okay, so maybe I'm going crazy. And so somehow it's this strategy that goes into, really into the, the, the ability to, to create, um, that destroys this, humiliates, that humiliates this possibility of any person to, to create thought. Or, and, then, and that's uh, according to Sully's work, and I think I'm somehow I relate to this also, that's um, maybe even more important, and it takes, like, according to her, three generations then to, in order to be able to open up um, for this kind of um, um, mm -hmm. repression and then suppression. Is it more? But aren't we today seeing, in fact, the production of what I would call neoliberal subjectivities very much out of commodity capitalism, about, uh, through consumerist, through the channeling of desire into consumption, uh, through the actual rupture uh, of the integrity of the body as sensorium, as receptor, into isolated senses, which are addressed through different forms of um, advertising, uh, different forms of seduction from the regime. So I, I see a very curious kind of fragmentation of the thinking body within this particular formation. And I also see a, a, a very curious movement within art practices, which seems to be seeking sometimes to actually push that fragmentation further as a kind of gesture towards naming and uh, kind of exploding and making visible that experience, and other strategies which actually seek to sidestep the fragmentation to offer a moment or an experience or an event which invites the reintegration of that. My own work tends towards the second, uh, but uh, yeah, so I think. If, if we look also, I was also reminded of, uh, Gita brought up the question of contemporary dance, but I was reminded very much of some of my own experiences in theater workshops and theater training, where whether it's the Grotowskian method or uh, work that Badal Sarkar did in India, a lot of the work that we did as actor training was in fact this kind of work of working with the senses, of reconnecting, and moving away from uh, a speech-dominated form of perception. So it's also to do with language and, uh, and the power of naming and how that often can become one of the mediators of the fragmentation. Uh, so this, the work with objects. Uh, so in new performance art in India, I think I see some attempts to try and actually work with this, but they don't come from that theatre tradition. So it's, it's quite a curious, it's like they're parallel lines, very often not speaking to each other. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Uh, I'm thinking that actually the new totalitarian regime is an invisible one nowadays. So it's, it's really the system and capitalism that incorporates everything. Uh, any, any gesture we make or any act of resistance is immediately incorporated. So, and this fragmentation of the body, um, I was thinking about um, uh, Gael, this, um, this uh, artist that was a student of Lisa Clark in her interview. She talks about these Googles uh, and how when they, when they would use it, wear it with the other, with someone else, you would see this, it would become clear, this whole fragmentation of your own body in combination with the other and how this experience was like um, devastating and so that, and the next, um, the next uh, step in the class was then to reintegrate the self somehow. Um, yeah, no, I, I was um, thinking that there's the... So for me, the, some of this thinking about the body and uh, the, the valorization of the body as a site, 
both for artistic inquiry as well as knowledge creation, is very tied to feminist recuperation of the body because the body was otherwise, in a sense, made abject, particularly in post-Enlightenment European discourse. Uh, body, earth, matter, uh, in the earlier periods of art were considered that which must be transcended through the spirit, so that old dualism between body and spirit. Uh, I think feminist thinking had a lot to do with bringing the body back into the center of the problematic, in, in fact, uh, opening out arguments about forms of knowledge which negate the body or which actually acknowledge the body in its fullest capacities. So for me, uh, this kind of retrospective naming of Lydia as feminist is interesting in, in that light. And yet we're, we're finding this in India as well, where artists who would not have called themselves feminists are being seen as, read as, re-described as feminists today from today's perspective. And I think that's fair enough, but when it, it's easier to do when the, the gap, the temporal gap is, is much longer. It is more complicated to do when in fact it's quite close. So if Lydia in the 80s is self-declaredly saying she's not a feminist, uh, I think Nasreen is also, Nasreen Mohamedi is someone who self-declaredly said, I am not a feminist. Uh, and both are being recuperated within a new interest in reading the work of women artists through the prism of feminism. Uh, I, this is for me quite a curious moment. I am a self-declared feminist artist, so this is something that I also think this is a marker, a distinction between women artists and feminist artists because we have, as in Brazil, I think a number of very powerful and uh, well-known prominent women artists, I think only some of them would actually think of themselves as feminists. And uh, there was a period where uh, the same artists actually resisted even being named as women artists because they saw it as a kind of ghettoization uh, and they preferred to be called artists alone. And you seem to, in your response to Gita, actually uh, repeat that statement that you don't need to say, uh, you don't need to look at this, but for me feminism is actually an analysis of the structures of power and uh, works which inquire into those and into how those structures of power construct the, the aesthetic relationship uh, becomes feminist in its, in its theory and it's an inquiry. So I'd like you to respond to that. Yeah, I, I believe that um, it always depends on the position you take in, in, your, in what you say, in your work. So um, I don't think it's a problem to include, uh, even if she said she was not her in a feminist reading. It's more like um, we are more um, uh, complex than that. So in some places I'm um, Latin America, that doesn't even make sense in Brazil, and in some places I'm a woman, or in some places I'm a feminist, or I, I don't know, if you, or I'm Jewish, or I'm not, or I'm Syrian Lebanese. I know, it's obvious, but it's, uh, there's a kind of, um, um, I think the most important, independently from uh, what, in which, um, specific niche you would put yourself for, for theory is the place where you stand when you speak. And I always feel I speak from the margin somehow or, or I have the ability to go um, and come back and move from the distance. I don't know if this is clear, but I think this is a, it's a very important um, to, to um, rethink and they structure the, 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 the structures of power all the time and depending on the situation you may be in one position or the other but it's always the, not the position of uh, yeah, or the position in, in the status quo, it's a position that can resist and question but in a more uh, fluid way um, so I think that's how I, I would uh, put myself in a um, 
So it's just not being labeled uh, under one name, but being able to move more freely and depending on the circumstances. Absolutely. I mean, uh, when I say I declare myself as a feminist, I also simultaneously uh, think of multiple feminisms. So uh, the labeling, the identi the sort of brand of shampoo identitarian politics, particularly in the US, uh, which sort of seems to proscribe rather than open up avenues of engagement. I'm completely with you on that. But I think it is also, uh, so multiple fluid identities moving between them, but I think there is also a political position that one takes. So whether it is a broad kind of anti-hegemonic position, or whether one is actually nuancing that anti-hegemonic position from a feminist position, uh, there would be a difference there. Yeah, so I don't see myself in the feminist position. I think since I, I started, uh, um, yeah, I, always, I was always trying to look for a common ground or an equal position in terms of being uh, from South America or from Brazil in a, in a system that it's over and over putting it back. So I would see... Um, so, um, but as far as I know, know there's quite a strong feminist movement. Uh, in Latin America and in Brazil itself, because I have, um, so would you, I mean, what kind of um, connection do you feel with that, or uh, is it at all, uh, is there a kind of conversation between uh, radical art practice and the feminist movement or the women's movement in Brazil? I think it's much more in all the countries around than in Brazil, mm -hmm. because Brazil has this very specific history, while in Argentina, for instance, that it's like the big, it's the big thing is literature, they are all male, or in Mexico, or, so it's, um, and I have many friends, that most of the artists and curators I work with for my whole life are feminists. So somehow I, I share this and I realized very early that, that because being from Brazil, maybe I was not formed by reading it, but I think there's, it's, it's also a, a more a position of everyday life, so, um, there's a lot to do with, for instance, there's a lot to do with um, support uh, of women and uh, education and then supporting and, and um, in an exhibition. So in Brazil, it's always a, a struggle because people don't even think about it. It's so, so of course, it's not a positive thing, but I'm always the one fighting to say, I'm not in a jury that uh, has 10 um, final artists and at least 50% needs to be a woman. I mean, this is for me so, it's a basic um, act of everything I do. But still, and so there I would be considered feminist, let's say, you know, because I fight for all of this. But, um, no, I don't know. I, I, I also feel, uh, not to um, excuse myself, but yesterday I was here um, listening to all of you speaking and I was quite impressed of how um, articulated all the artists are which I was thinking about how it's, it's not the same in Brazil. We don't have a, the education is so, it's not so solid um, as artists maybe, but, but in general, since the education went. So um, I think these studies will come later on in life when you go after them, you know. Could you say a little more about contemporary art practice in Brazil today where you would see maybe some resonances of the kind of inquiry that Lydia Cox's work represents? Mm. Yeah, well, n formally not. I mean, there's many formally um, works, works that formally look like Elliot Sico, Lydia Clark, because there, there was this um, demand somehow of international scene to go there and look for artists that were um, continuing. But for instance, I work um, for 13 years, I think now 14 years with Renata Lucas. But today I didn't present any of my work or the project and, and Renata Lucas is an artist that she, um, yeah, she's really intervening in the architecture, in the space and creating this kind of uh, total disrupted spaces and uh, each work she does is, um, each work she does is, uh, yeah, it's, for me it's very difficult to talk about um, art 
without uh, images. I feel it's, it becomes too abstract. I always need to show. But, um, but there's some words like Renata Lucas has a work um, that is called uh, Cruzamento Crossroad that she did in uh, first in Rio de Janeiro in 2003. And it was, uh, she was invited to do um, a work in a collective exhibition in a Castelinho do Flamengo. It's like an old construction, a house. And she was given a room. So she arrived up in the room, she opened the windows, and she saw the crossroad outside. So what she did is, it's a basically only to put um, um, plywood um, exactly in, in a very, um, a plywood very close to the asphalt, you know. And so she activated this crossroad space somehow. So the opening happened there, and it was there for, I think, 18 days. And, um, and so she's always dealing with all these levels, um, not, not necessarily visible levels, so it's not only architecture, but space, social, uh, people crossing it, the cars, and she needs to deal with all the traffic laws, and uh, she needs to deal with all, negotiate with all. And for me, for instance, this work relates a lot to the, to the Bishu called uh, Monument for All Circumstances, that it's so, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, like anywhere you put, this, it's, it's the smallest visual she has done, it's 40 by 40, and so anywhere you put this, it becomes a, a place um, for that, that can, that, that as a monument, right? So, uh, and I feel the work of Hinata, for instance, you can trace relations, um, but, but, um, but I think of my, yeah, not, not formal relations, but yeah. But in terms of the inquiry, as, yeah. Yeah, and Alicia Clark wrote a lot, and many artists read it, you know, it's very important for all the generations that came after, also she wrote about the, the body as the house, so it's really connected to space and architecture, and, and many of the artists that I work with are, are really um, dealing with space in, a, in, in, a, in different senses um, of space. So I think it comes from an elaboration that... that uh, it begins so with her, yeah. or, yeah. or in that period, and, and, other, and other people in that yeah, period. Yeah. Um, a last question, which is, there's this term called, uh, been used now for some years, uh, in the Euro-American uh, art discourse of relational aesthetics, and uh, it is translated and enacted in very different kinds of ways to the kinds of experiments with relational objects. So, would you like to talk a bit about that? I think it's very problematic. Um, For me not too. In the way, yeah, but the, you know, what I understood in this specific case, because I know um, Nicola, and it's that, I don't know, but there's something that happens which is like, for instance, I work with a certain group of artists, my way of working is like, I work long term, it's an artist, I work always with them, so we sing together. And I think everywhere you would have these groups where you know um, you, you sing through their artwork and it's a conversation through the whole life. And so sometimes it happens that if they are in certain specific places, like my understanding is that Nicola Bomio was writing specifically about his friends or the artists that were all living in New York in a certain time. It was a Hirkis um, Ravanesha, uh, Philippe Parenot, even Kasten was there, Kasten Holler, that I'm more, I'm more interested in the work nowadays. But anyway, they are, they are different artists, but at this very moment, I think he tried to articulate or elaborate what these people were doing. And my, 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 I'm very skeptic to the fact that everywhere I go in Latin America, in even Brazil, they just had a new translation of it, and they are reading and applying to everything. So I think the problem is, it's really like this, um, the, na the problems of the namings, that uh, it, it's that, I think the, the artistic practice is always creating new, it, it doesn't fit to any, the names are in order to, you know, make departments or publish a book, <laughs> and then, but the artists should um, always escape from them, and, and they do. But then uh, I think it's uh, problematic. And but there was a time when um, people were really critical in Brazil, and I thought it's, it's not even necessary. Like, uh, and invited uh, him to say, how can you write about relational aesthetics and not mention the relational objects of Nigel Clark? But I think he was talking about something else in a very specific context. It's like how Foster. I don't know how it is here, but that, like ten years ago, when I did a 
15 years ago in my dissertation in the master in the Universidad of São Paulo, people would take everything he wrote and apply to every, every and, and he starts the book saying, this is a very specific reading of a very specific scene in New York. I don't know, I think um, there's a tendency to reply things on top and I'm always trying to, but uh, it's, it's, why you, you would it's like we're, to... We're familiar with discourse actually producing practice rather than discourse arising from thinking through practice. Exactly. And this is a risk that we particularly run in, uh, in an era where we have access via the internet and via much more increased conversation and exchanges globally where there is this kind of secondary mimesis which infects practice itself and it is very troubling. But I think it would be nice to open it up to yeah. uh, the audience now and uh, interesting exchange of ideas. Uh, I was just curious about whether in terms of contemporary Brazilian art, some of the uh, earlier discussions of the uh, phase of uh, say the 1920s, Franz Rowe and his definitions of magic realism are at all still sort of pertinent and uh, still uh, crucial to the uh, discourse, especially given the fact that, well, of course, in literature, magical realism is a uh, major genre to date sort of that juxtaposition of the fantastical and the everyday so uh, sort of uh, uh, full of possibilities in terms of especially contesting regimes of power, the damage to the sensorium, and also, the, also in the context of censorship, articulating that which otherwise might remain unspeakable or which may remain unspoken uh, and unaddressed. So I was just wondering whether Franz Rowe's ideas and the theory of magic realism is relevant to contemporary art practice in Brazil. Mm. Yeah, um, no, I don't think so. I think it's a very, um, it's in the domains of literature and mostly like Argentina and then going up South America. Um, but something that is quite uh, peculiar of um, Brazil, I think, it's this, um, this known exchange between the disciplines that was something that, that's why it's um, such a pity that in the, in the moment that th this really happened, like Caetano Veloso, like a very pop musician who was doing this Tropicalia, and there was a collaboration of artists doing the posters of the Cinema Novo and the music. So it was a really like a fertile moment um, um, of production when the dictatorship came and crossed and stopped it, but still, there are not so, well, there is the concrete poetry, let's say, not literature, but, uh, but the, the artists, they are into uh, concrete poetry. There, it's a very important movement in Sao Paulo, maybe you're familiar with, but this is a, a conversation too today, I think, with art, with fine arts, but um, I think the, the magic realism, no. Mm. Thank you both, that was very interesting. I'm particularly uh, touched by the idea of the damage of sensorium. Um, I, I don't think you will find this relevant, um, considering your, what you said about Boria. But do you know the French theorist Jacques Rancière, who writes about the partage du sensible? Do you think that analysis of aesthetics as politics? You have to speak a little bit. Oh. Do you think the, sorry, Rancière's partage du sensible, the distribution of the sensible, um, and his analysis of art and aesthetics as politics, do you think that bears relevance to what you've been discussing about the damage of the sensorium? It may be relevant. Many things are relevant. I just, um, and I didn't mean to, uh, well, okay, I was criticizing Bohio, but uh, mostly this relational aesthetic um, imposition over but, um, um, yeah, I mean, what can I say? It's relevant, but I think it's important also to always, um, for us specifically, as a still colonized mind in Brazil and so, in South America, I think, too, you know, we need to decolonize um, every day somehow. So, of course, um, all of this comes and we read, but it's kind of... Um, 
Yeah, I think it's exactly what I was saying before. It's not against, of course, the thinking cross in many in many ways, but it's also important to to look at different kind of reading of readings. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm not. I don't feel familiar enough with the work to um, criticize or not. Uh, in, the, in the case of Hansier, he has been to Brazil. It's all published in Portuguese, and people like he has. A, he's a kind of idol there somehow. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Anya, can, can I invite you to uh, do a very, very uh, unlikely and dramatic uh, relationship or repudiation? I would imagine it would be a repudiation of any relationship, but it would probably uh, throw light on the development of the, the points of this juncture in Brazilian art. What was the understanding of anthropophagia in the 1960s and in Brazil and its rethinking re and its, uh, uh, its uh, significance when these, more, these much more fragile gestures that were made by Ligia uh, Clark and Elio Oitisica and a very uh, um, uh, aggressive concept of anthropophagia in the 20s. Perhaps you could say something about anthropophagia in case the members of the audience are not that familiar, but yeah. even otherwise, even from your, even if they are familiar, we'd like, I'd like to know how you articulate it from the position of your commitment to the kind of aesthetic and the kind of politics of Ligia Clark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, the, in Brazil, in the 1914 and, and in the 1920s there was a, an avant-garde and so and and at that point it was a so you see at that point there was this uh, very close relation with art and literature so actually the two artists were women the main artists and and so um Tarsila do Amaral had made a drawing and so Oswald de Andrade wrote this manifest um about anthropophagia um referring to the native, uh, some native um, tribes in Brazil that um, would um, eat their enemies. Um, so um, basically, so the process is much more complex than that, but um, the thing is that what they would do is like, uh, it's, a, it's a very long ritual, but the thing that happens is that um, they, when they get the enemy, if they kept their enemy and kill them, so in this very specific ritual, but that was very present in the, in the lands that was often called Brazil, um, they will eat the part of the body that they will consider um, the best of what the enemy had. So if it was a very brave person, they will eat, I don't know, let's, <laughs> if it's a very... Um, <laughs> intelligent, they will eat the brain. So that, there's this whole ritual. And, but even speaking like that, it's a um, very uh, basic um, knowledge of it. But um, so he wrote, he took this in order to write in, in uh, 1928, this manifest, talking about how Brazilians somehow were, it was already this um, try to search for an autonomy or colonization that comes back again and again and never solves itself how um, Brazilians would somehow devour the, the, coloni the colonizers, um, the Europeans, and then digest it and um, put out something new out of it. So even if we are um, part of this, um, like the school, the university comes from France, um, 19th century French university. So we are, for, we are in the Western part of the world. We are formed by Europeans, and actually the native um, were were practically um, totally killed in Brazil. And so it's really like the the people are, um, yeah, a mixture of the Portuguese, uh, Spanish that came, and the the people from Africa that was brought as slaves. But anyway, so he makes this relation between. Um, he talks about um, the school and the forest. Uh, it's a kind of romantic way, as Oswald Jandraji write it, but it's really about the anthropophagic ritual as a way of us um, devouring the enemies and 
bringing something new in a creative way. And so, actually, in Lisha's um, writings, she doesn't talk about anthropophagia, she talks about cannibalism, which has a different... Um, um, not related. Oh, it's related, it's like people eating people, but the anthropophagic... <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I don't know, there's some text uh, that, that put attention into this, how she was using the word cannibalism instead of anthropophagia. Um, but, that, but there's one work by her called Baba Anthropophagica, which is Baba is like a spit, spit and it was this um, that she did with the students in Sorbonne, where they, we all put this um, lines inside their mouth, and so they will take it out with the spit, and one of them will be totally rolled on this, and, and, and it's, again, it's an experience that is very difficult to... There's a text by Sueli Honi where she did this to herself, like uh, 10 years ago, and she wrote about her experience of being the one in this Baba Tumufashka. But I would say that this came back to, and stayed, came back to our um, imaginary uh, with, um, with the Biennale in 98, when Paolo had came off, he, the Biennale of Paolo, that you probably know, but it's a very important, um, um, it's a very important exhibition there, in, in even in Latin America, and I think it was the first time that he 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 he, he rewrote. It was a try to rewrite history, having as a starting point something local. So, looking at our history from a perspective from Brazil, and then what he did was to bring back the anthropophagia. And I think it was very fortunate in the sense that after that it became common language somehow. So it's a, it's a, it's a try to, to bring back to us this kind of the history of art, including of course what was happening there as well. And since then um, it's even, I heard it in different contexts in New York, and some places like, oh, anthropophagic, it's like it became like known, not only the manifest, but this idea of Brazilians as being, but I think um, the person that wrote um, there's an anthropologo, anthropologist that became quite known now because his book, um, his books are published in uh, English and, and French. Um, Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, and, and he r writes about the read of anthropo, like he, he really um, brings it to the present in a way that is very relevant um, now. Um, so. And everyone is reading it's kind of all the artists, and uh, I think it's a kind of a, a, a rereading of it. To, uh, yeah. I think for any post colonial situation, it's always been a very interesting way of thinking about the absorption and new forms of hybrid production, which is something that we inhabit very much in India as well. So there was uh, always a kind of pleasure in encountering that whole statement. Uh, about cannibalism and anthropophagia in the Latin American text that one encountered some time ago. Uh, I just want to connect two comments, like your comment about uh, like the danger of discourse leading practice rather than other way around, and your comment on the like, comparative articulation levels of Brazilian and Indian artists. So. I was just thinking that, as we know, that develop articulation does not really uh, doesn't just uh, influence the way we speak. It also influences the way we think because you cannot speak it out in your mind first, then you cannot think it, right? So I was thinking, is there a dark side of being over articulate as a visual artist, and how that affects your own thinking and your own practice? That when you can justify and support and theorize no matter what you're doing. So I just wanted, like both of you to speak. Well, I think one of my first points of connection with Anna was when she said that I come to theory by having thought through artistic practice and then I recognize in the theory something that I have already been thinking about that has started to form and for me it's very similar. But having then uh, found or recognized something that I was thinking about, perhaps not so clearly formed, I will then enter that space within its own terms, which will of course look back and influence the way I think. And I think one goes through periods where you find a far more sophisticated scholarly opening out of certain tentative ideas that have come up in your own work. 
and they can be actually a bit terrifying. They can actually paralyze you, that you, you, you feel unable to create because of the burden of this theoret theoretical exposition. So yes, there is a dark side. And I don't think, I think it's a risk that uh, being articulate becomes a kind of gloss over the actual practice. Uh, it, it's a risk and I think uh, one has to be well aware of that risk. But for me, the, the, the pleasure in, in being able to speak to some extent about ideas that matter to me is, is the possibility of conversation. So it's always moving out and opening up and reinforming, making you rethink or relearn or, uh, or learn afresh. And it's, and it's also a tool that you can use in different ways. So being articulated doesn't mean you're going to go and use some philosophical ideas, but you can depart from your own. The same um, desire that makes you produce art can make you verbalize it. And I think it's very important. In Brazil, there's this um, still romantic idea that, um, I mean, it, it happened after the dictatorship, because if you, if you read of uh, Elio de Sica, Lisa Clark, all these artists from this generation who were writing, they were absolutely um, articulated and, and they had knowledge of, they would read all of this. And, but there, there's some idea of uh, nowadays that the artist, I'm an artist, I don't, I don't need to speak, you know? And I think this is, a, it's very problematic, um, especially for the artists because otherwise uh, the articulation of your own uh, work becomes in the, Becomes too, you become too vulnerable where other people can articulate yes, about yeah, it. Like, I don't know, and, and then sometimes you can be too fascinated by some ideas and you just bring them, I don't know, but I, I think this articulation, what we call articulation, comes from, um, it's a tool, comes from school and learning, because I see, since I teach in the US, I, I, my students, they come with a, um, they, 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 they know how to sell themselves so well. They have this power of rhetorics, even if they have nothing to say. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and, and what I think it's, I admire, you know, and I see that I would never be like that. Because my way of thinking is all over the place, and also, but I was not educated. When they're two years old, they were already making presentations of their drawings, you know? So there's something, it's, a bit, it's true. Uh, uh, this, the daughter of a, of a friend of mine came home to give, give a presentation of a drawing. Like, anyway, so um, there's uh, of course extremes, so, uh, uh, but uh, I think it's a good tool for you to um, be, I mean, I was very uh, happy yesterday to be able to enter uh, the, the mind of these artists that were here and so generally all of you you open, um, you open your thoughts loud, and this is something that uh, I relate to. I think in different contexts this doesn't happen, but it was there was time to think, and I could enter and inhabit their thoughts and, and put mine. And, and, and this depends on you being able to verbalize. No? So, thank you. One more. What's One the I don't have a clock either. So, time to wind up. We've gone over time, so last question. Uh, yeah, I, I like the talk. The, the question is uh, when we think of art and therapy, art as therapy, and put uh, in context to a military regime in Brazil uh, and cure. Uh, what do you think of football, which is very popular, which is kind of an expression, and its relationship with therapy or cure? Football. football. Uh, Soccer. Like uh, the way we think of art as therapy, art as therapy and cure, in context to military regime in, Japan, in uh, Brazil, what do you think of, I'm just curious, what do you think of uh, football, which is very popular in Brazil? And uh, it's an expression, uh, and it's very connected to body. So, what do you think of? Uh, do you find any trace of football as a therapy or cure? Do you find any trace? Of well, I think um, we own uh, a lot of our body movements 
um, we owe to the, the people from Africa that came. So Brazil is not, it's as the most cliche is football and samba, but it, in, in terms of music and dancing, this is part of the culture and it's integrated in all of us. So it's, it's not uh, belonging to one or other person. It's something that it's part of it. And, and football, I will be more skeptical, but I understand what you say about, if I think of a movement of the body and how it's true, like the Brazilian football players go all over and they are very good. I don't know. I would have to think about it, but um, but I would um, I would uh, really acknowledge um, this culture from Africa because um, I've been I work in many different um, countries in South America where it's only um, the Spanish colonizers and it's pretty different because the Spanish would not mix with the local people so it's the it's very different. Portuguese, Portuguese would arrive and suddenly mix with everyone, and so that's why Brazil has this different. But but Colombia was the only one where, where I felt this um, relation to the body. Like we are very um, there's something that that uh, we are very connected to the body and the necessities of the body or any kind of illness. And I felt this in Colombia, and I felt that it may be this um, this mixture. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, when I traveled in Brazil, uh, I spent some time in Bahia. And it was, I just thought, what a wonderful life. You swim in the morning, you eat excellent food, and you dance in the evening. And this is every day. And you work sometime in between. <laughs> a very nice way of living. A very bodily way of living. Yeah. Uh, we'll end the session here. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so much.